This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. On Friday, September 27th, the Norris Group proudly presents its 12th annual award-winning black tie event, I Survived Real Estate. An incredible lineup of industry experts will join Bruce and Aaron Norris to discuss perplexing industry trends, head-scratching legislation, massive tech disruption, and opportunities emerging for real estate professionals. All proceeds from the event benefit Make-A-Wish and St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. This event is not possible without the generous help of the following platinum partners. The San Diego Creative Real Estate Investors Association, Invest Club, Think Realty, Coach Fullerton, Property Radar, The Apartment Owners Association, MVT Productions, and Realty 411. Visit isurvivedrealestate.com for event information. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris, and today our special guest is Stephen Wagner. Stephen is the 2019 president of the Appraisal Institute and has served in various roles within the National and Hoosier State Chapter. He teaches general qualifying education and advanced level appraisal courses and seminars for the Appraisal Institute. He's a graduate of uh, Purdue University. He has been an, a chief appraiser for a regional bank and currently is a senior appraiser in the appraisal firm of Terzo and Malagna. I knew I was going to do that in Indianapolis. Stephen. Welcome to our show. Thank you, Bruce. Good to be here. Appreciate it. If I were an appraiser in 2007 and happened to have an accident and put me in a coma and I woke up to today and began my career again, um, would I recognize the industry? Uh, well, heaven forbid that would have happened, but uh, no, you probably wouldn't. Uh, we've had uh, significant change regulatory regulatory wise uh you know technology has had an impact uh, over the last 10 12 years um it, it definitely would be a different uh, realm today no question what were some of the things that were implemented you know right after the real estate crash say after 2009 that were implemented that are still a part of the appraisal world well you know the regulations uh tightened up quite a bit uh, with a focus on appraiser independence and so forth. Um, and uh, some of that certainly remains, um, absolutely it remains in terms of appraiser independence. Um, but in recent times here, the last year or so, we've seen some significant changes in the regulatory structure, you know, Dodd-Frank, a lot of that was rolled back in terms of uh, the financial industry. And um, so today, the threshold levels um, for loan transactions that require appraisals has been raised significantly. On the commercial real estate side, uh, last March it came through, they took the uh, threshold from $250,000 loan transaction value up to uh, half a million, uh, doubling it. Uh, more recently, we've now seen um, where the agencies have taken the residential loan threshold from 250 up to 400,000. And also, uh, in just the last uh, month or two, uh, we've seen where the NCUA made a move, the National uh, Credit Union Administration made a move to go from uh, $250,000 loan, transa loan transaction value all, all the way up to a million. Uh, so quadrupled that rate. Uh, so th things are uh, significantly different as far as when an appraisal is actually required. Um, on the residential side, uh, you know, things are um, changing, too, in terms of what you see with uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac requirements. Uh, um, so, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a different day. Uh, if I'm an appraiser in 2007, I don't know what a, an appraisal threshold is. So an, an appraisal threshold is um, for, you know, the 
banking agencies and what that for a federally related transaction if the loan amount is greater than 250,000 was the case then an appraisal was required under 250,000 it could go with uh, an evaluation and as i said uh, it's significantly different now because those thresholds have been um, raised significantly uh, on the residential side 250 to 4 on uh, commercial real estate side 250 to 500 uh, commercial real estate side with the NCUA has gone from 250 to a million. So if you have uh, a million dollar transaction, loan transaction value, um, then they're required to have an appraisal. Uh, anything below that, they go with an evaluation. Similarly for the 500,000 side uh, with respect to the OCC, FDIC, and the Fed. Um, well, and evaluations can essentially be done by just about anybody that has uh, real estate knowledge. So uh, we're definitely looking at, at a different uh, stage here in terms of uh, risk mitigation, uh, safety and soundness, and um, frankly, consumer protection as well. You know, what's interesting about it, it seems to me that Picking a number and saying that's a national policy, that doesn't seem reasonable to me because let's say in Florida, median price in Florida is, I'll pick a number close to it, say 250. So a 400 level, um, not needing an appraisal, would, would be a huge percentage of the transactions. In California with a median price of 600, it would be far less than half. So how do they... Why do they attach it to a, a number as opposed to some other, you know, differentiation in a state? So in San Francisco, where the median price is two million, you'd be you'd be appraising everything, and in a place like Texas, you might be appraising nothing. So, in general, the requirements are going to require something, an evaluation or an appraisal, depending upon the risk profile. Uh, of the property and some things like that, uh, um, you know, uh, credit concerns and, and those kinds of things. But, you know, you're right. I've heard various justifications, um, you know, one being that, uh, you know, that they looked at it from an inflationary perspective because the threshold levels have been in place since about uh, 1990 or so, the early 90s. Um, and so they've uh, used in inflation as being a justification. Um, but uh, there are a large percentage of transactions, potentially, uh, that won't really have an appraisal, which at the end of the day is certainly the gold standard um, in uh, property valuation, real property valuation. Uh, you know, there are other things that they're using these days, as you know, AVMs, automated valuation models. Um, again, evaluations um, which uh, have a uh, lower uh, required requirement in terms of uh, development of the value opinion and uh, um, reporting requirements and those sorts of things. So uh, evaluations, you know, not an appraisal. And uh, in terms of uh, consumer protect protection, uh, particularly in the one to four family uh, bracket, residential wise, you know, clearly it's uh, uh, the gold standard. And certainly, uh, uh, many commercial properties are are complex and require um, due diligence in terms of analysis and so forth by um, a valuation professional. Um, some of the uh, rural areas or lower density markets, um, they have uh, significantly lower uh, loan transaction values, but potentially the risks are, are big there too. And, you know, when you have the number of loans you just implied a moment ago, you know, a lot of smaller loans adds up to a, a, a bigger problem too. So if, if you don't have adequate uh, risk mitigation in place, it's... Uh, it's a question of safety and soundness. Well, you know, one of the things about appraisal is you usually show up to the property and actually visually see what it is you're looking at. Are, 
Are many of the other alternatives not really doing that? Yeah, uh, Bruce, forgive me. I, I, I think I heard the question, but uh, I think you said something about uh, viewing the property versus some of the other types of valuations, like maybe an ABM where you don't actually see the property. Is that Yeah, that's interested? basically the the idea that, you know, when an appraiser, part of his job is to visually see the property, hopefully the inside. And when you're doing another method, you don't have to, you may not have to even do that. Uh, that's true. And again, that's part of the reason that we, we always uh, say that the appraisal um, is the gold standard, having an appraiser out on site to see the property. Now, there, there may be some instances where actually seeing uh, the property uh, is of less import. Um, you, you know, there's nothing that says that an appraiser has to inspect a property. So you might be, uh, uh, for example, uh, monitoring a portfolio on a quarterly basis. And, you know, unless there's some substantial change in the markets and or the condition of the property, seeing it again might not be necessary. But certainly on a first look basis, a uh, a purchase transaction basis or a new loan basis in general, uh, seeing the property and understanding uh, some of the nuances that have an impact on value relative to condition, functional concerns, and so forth, uh, size, all of those kinds of things where you get that information firsthand, it's, it sure is an awful lot better to have an appraiser's eyeballs on the property, no question. I'll give you a real life example of a necessity of seeing something. I've been in the house buying business for a long time and received a phone call and uh, discussed the numbers with the gentleman and uh, could even see a picture of the property on the computer and looked at the numbers. It was great. We came to an agreement over the phone. He was in another state. I went to see the property, which I intended to close the day after. It was no longer there, actually. (laughs) <laughs> it was no longer what it was no there. longer there the city had demolished yeah, it <laughs> um, yeah that can be a problem you know if if, <laughs> if nothing else and in 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 certain segments of uh, particularly like we'll say maybe an equity loan a home equity loan or something like that um <laughs> Just having a, an appraiser out on site may be very helpful because, you know, we've found where properties have literally burned down and they're not there anymore. Um, any, any number of reasons like that, if, if for nothing else, verification that the property is still there and, and uh, you know, largely the way it was perceived to be uh, is, can be critical, no question. Yeah, that was a little bit of a hard phone call to give the guy too. You know, by the way, your house no longer exists. Um, yeah. Uh, appraisal management companies, are they still with us? And, and what, is, what has been the impact on the industry? Uh, so appraisal uh, management companies, AMCs, are more prolific today than, um, than certainly in 2007, I would say. Um, and there are a significant number of them. Um, in many ways, uh, they came about with the notion of um, providing an extra layer, um, kind of a firewall uh, for appraiser independence. Um, you know, you could go through an AMC, a lender could, and the AMC took care of uh, choosing the appraiser and um, possibly some of the review process as well. Um, different phases of the overall appraisal process could be taken care of by the appraisal management company. Um, in some ways, uh, some appraisal management companies wind up being a, a, a middleman that's um, probably not helpful. Um, but there are some good AMCs, and um, in that regard, can be helpful, particularly to do uh, maybe smaller uh, lending institutions that don't have uh, the availability uh, resources to have uh, an in-house appraisal staff and so forth could be useful in that regard. Um, In in some ways, though, there's been a, uh, you know, a a middleman problem where appraisal fees are mixed around and what What's actually showing up on closing statements as being appraisal fees are actually fees to an entire uh, 
management company fee and the appraiser is getting a fraction of it and so the impression is that appraisals are much more expensive than they actually are in some cases uh, there's also the you know the problem with um, AMC's in a lot of cases has been um, uh, speed and price being the determinants uh, primary determinants of uh, uh, who gets an appraisal and uh, that's not always you know speed and Speed and price is not always the best uh, way to go about a, uh, choosing an appraisal or an appraiser. Um, and, uh, you know, you you can have it fast and cheap, but it begs the quality, or you're going to have it fast, cheap, and good quality. And so sometimes appraisal management companies have been um, uh, pretty helpful, but in some instances um, it, it has not been the best situation. It's... It's sad, too, to me, because I've been in the industry for a long time, and we've done, say, 1,500 transactions where we'll need an appraisal for a private loan. And we predominantly have uh, relied on one appraiser for a great majority of that time. And the reason we used him is he was an expert. He was, a, he was familiar with rehabs, and he was familiar with the areas, and he didn't have any agenda but to tell us, what the truth was. And I wanted it. I, he told me in a letter one time, he says, you literally, after having done 14,000 appraisals, you are the only company who has not directed me to a value ever. And I just thought, wow, that's a, that's kind of a, a sad statement. But I was, if I was in, if I had to use an appraisal management company, I would not be able to direct myself to the best talent i would have to get directed by other methodologies is that correct so um yeah the comment that you made about uh, not being directed to a number is is disconcerting uh, um as you you uh intimated you know appraisers provide independent impartial and objective opinions of value uh, that is the way it's supposed to be, and uh, for a long time there were, you know, abuses in that regard. Now, in the in the lending in- industry, um, it is required that the lending institution, who is the client, order the appraisal, or some agent thereof uh, order the appraisal. Um, if if you're talking about a a, a private uh, situation where maybe you just want to know a value for your own edification in terms of making a buying decision and so forth, you can have direct uh, contact with um, an expert. But because of appraiser independence uh, regulations, um, a borrower can't go out, get an appraisal, take it to a bank and say, I need to get a loan. Uh, that mitigates the appraiser independence uh, notion. Um, and so what you're doing, you can do. I mean, if, you, if you're if you interested in, you know, financing property yourself and you want to get an appraisal done on a private situation like that, you can make that kind of contact. And, um, you know, appraisers are a, a great resource in that regard, as you, as you mentioned a moment ago, that are the expert in their particular markets and so forth. So um, you can do that, that but uh, in the you know, any, any federally regulated lender, uh, you cannot actually engage uh, an appraisal and then take it into that uh, federally regulated lender. It, it, let's see, it, are the um, management companies able to direct an appraiser to the best talent if it's if it's their choosing or is it is it is it a random selection that they have to make as well so um i think you asked about a a lending company can can you ask them to use a a particular appraiser okay yes (laughs) i'm sorry i'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you bruce Uh, i apologize no that's i'm sorry too yeah so, actually, no, that would be what's known as a kind of a borrower-directed appraisal or a borrower-directed
forward direction as far as obtaining an appraiser. What you can ask for as a borrower is to make sure that the, the lender is using someone that is uh, qualified. And you could ask, say, for an appraisal institute designated member to be uh, the appraiser. But that that that's about it as far as any of that kind of request is concerned. Um, otherwise, it it impinges on appraiser independence. Okay. There's uh, broker price opinions and evaluations and other uh, terms that are used. Um, I'm just curious about what percentage of those are, are used in lieu of appraisals and uh, where are they uh, actually allowed in, in place of an appraisal? Well, again, um, as I was mentioning, as far as lending institutions are concerned, um, you know, under the uh, uh, threshold levels, uh, they can go with an evaluation. They can do it for uh, renewals of loans. Um, sometimes, regardless of the, of the loan amount, they can use evaluations. Um, typically, they, uh, they're not able to use the BPO. Um, that's been stipulated as not being an actual evaluation according to the regulators. But um, it is my understanding that there is a substantial uh, ratio of evaluations that are used um, greater than appraisals. Um, I can't tell you an actual number, but uh, from what I understand, it's uh, a significant um, amount of evaluations that are being done. So it's a, it's a broad market, and you know, um, appraisers can do evaluations, and uh, you know, currently they they can do them um, under USPAP. Uh, some states are actually moving toward. Um, uh, saying that an appraiser doesn't actually have to um, do an evaluation consistent with USPAP. They, they, they're exempted from it. Uh, some states have, have moved toward that. There's a substantial market out there for evaluations, and you know we think that um, making it easier for appraisers to provide evaluations is, is a good thing on many uh, levels, uh, particularly because of the demand for them, and secondly, uh, who best to provide value opinions um, other than appraisers, um, and so uh, other than just somebody with real estate knowledge. Uh, so we're a proponent of, of it being easier for appraisers to do evaluations. They can do them right now in the form of restricted appraisal reports. Um, it, there is a way, but uh, it, it's not exactly a level playing field at, at the moment um, uh, in terms of what appraisers have to do versus others. Okay. Uh, the emergence of iBuyers, how, how has that impacted the appraisal business? The emergence of iBuyers, how has it uh, impacted uh, appraisers? Yes. It's, you know, not entirely clear yet. Um, but there are, it's definitely, um, going to have some impact, I would say. From what I understand, the I buyers don't use, <clears throat> pardon me, any kind of, uh, valuation, um, from an appraiser. Uh, they, they typically, from what I understand, use ABMs. And uh, they may use other tools as well. I don't know, but typically that's what I've been hearing they use. Here's where um, I can say that there's going to be some impact on appraisal, and that is that a lot of these transactions where the I buyer company buys the property, and from what I understand, uh, the 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 seller is going to have to pay a fee. Um, sometimes as high as 7 to 10 percent, and then typically uh, it's my understanding that the iBuyer companies are paying um, somewhere in the range of, we'll say, 80 to um, between 80 and 100 percent of uh, market value or their perception of it. Um, so it's, it's uh, certainly, a, you know, got a cost associated with it, but it may be beneficial uh, to that particular seller because maybe they have, before they can buy another house, they've got to sell one. Uh, they're not uh, stuck maybe with uh, some of the costs.
costs associated with uh, selling a home, you know, not having your home sold and having to move and put things in storage and so on and so forth, uh, other types of bridge loans, all those kinds of things that may save them uh, that kind of uh, hassle, if you will. I, 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 clearly, there's a cost associated with it. Now, here's what happens, particularly in the residential sector, is um, – the Fannie Mae requirements are that you have to report, um, it's a used PAP requirement that you have to report the sale and transfer history of the subject property up to three years back. But for the GSEs, Fannie Freddie, they have, you have to report the sale and transfer history of the comparable sales that you're using as an appraiser. So let's say that an iBuyer transaction happens at, uh, we'll keep the number simple here for the sake of argument, $100,000. And um, 30 to 45 days later, they sell that house after maybe doing a couple of things to it or, or not. And they sell the house for whatever it is, let's say 120000 Well, an appraiser goes to use that transaction as a comparable. comparable. They're going to have to report that it sold previously and um, hopefully be able to determine that, you know, it was an iBuyer transaction um, and that may account for why the sale price was so low compared to the, the current sale price some 45 days later. Uh, appraisers are going to have to do their due diligence uh, to find out how the discounts actually are and, um, you know, what kind of fees were involved and so forth that impacted the price. So. It'll have an impact on, on valuation in one way or, or another in terms of the appraisal process. Okay. Stephen, we've run out of time. I, I actually really do respect appraisers. I rely on them when I'm, I'm in an area that I don't know. We just built a house in Florida. Before we did it, I just hired an appraiser. and I said, uh, tell me what this house is going to be worth on this lot. And uh, I, felt, I felt comfortable with somebody's independent decision telling me what the value was. And uh, I think that's a, that's a big statement because I would rather have them tell me honestly than somebody that had a vested interest in a number coming in at a certain amount. So I have a lot of respect for the industry and uh, thanks for taking on the role of uh, an industry that's kind of taken the, uh, quite a hit in the last few years, you know, with the assumption that, you know, we need to correct everything, whereas probably a great percentage of the people do a great job and know exactly what they're doing. So, again, thank you for your service to our industry. I really appreciate it. Well, it's uh, excellent to hear of uh, your support and, and uh, use of uh, appraiser profession professionals. And uh, I've certainly enjoyed being uh, here with you uh, on the line today. And thank you very much uh, uh, for myself and on behalf of the Appraisal Institute. Okay. Stephen, thanks a lot. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under California DRE License 01219911, Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab. The Norris Group would like to thank its gold sponsors for supporting I Survived Real Estate, Coldwell Banger Town & Country, in a day development inland valley association of realtors keystone cpa las brisas escrow la south ria michael ryan and associates norcal ria nsdrei orange county real estate investors pacific premier bank pasadena phoebe shenbaum group sjrei spinnaker loans South OC RIA, U Direct IRA Services, White House Catering, Wilson Investment Properties. See iSurvivedRealEstate.com for event information. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com.